Welcome to the tutorial. And this tutorial is designed to help you with the questions at the end of the essay, The Destruction of Culture by Chris Hedges. And let's, uh, let's deal with question number one, which is, um, why does Chris Hedges open his essay with both exposition and argument? Where in the text does he shift between exposition, narration, and argument? And what is the effect of shifting modes of discourse in this way? Let's first define the, the terms in this question. Exposition is an explanation of ideas, where argument, you're, you're having, you have an assertion, point of view that you're trying to prove or disprove. A shift is usually a, a tone change or a organization change, a dramatic change in the text. Modes of discourse are different ways you develop ideas. Narration, argument, exposition are some discourses, comparing and contrasting, dividing things up, um, those are some other popular ways of uh, modes of discourse. So let's uh, let's attack this question. The opening paragraphs include exposition, and he uh, used, and then he uh, has a series of of uh, assertions to begin his argument. Hedges establishes his viewpoint on culture in wartime, saying things like the state seeks to destroy its own culture. The myth of war entices a nation to glory and sacrifice. Those are in the first paragraph. Um, he adds to these assertions um, by explaining the origins of the ideas, uh, like in uh, those who uh, question the value and cost of the veracity of the myth are branded as eternal enemies. That's in paragraph one. War and the national myth that fuels are the purveyors of low culture. That's in paragraph two. By combining explaining or exposition and argument, Hedges uh, gets a, a factual, unemotional tone um, in the essay. The tone is detached because it's basically uh, based on facts. He hasn't gotten emotional with us yet. He establishes his uh, credibility, his ethos, as a seasoned foreign correspondent later on by uh, uh, letting us know that he understands the situation and history um, around the Balkans region. He's been there as a reporter. Um, he knows the history of that region by seeing it for himself. All right, so I hope this uh, helps you understand this. Let's see um, um, the next question. The next question, uh, this one here, Number two, note how Hedges effects transitions. For example, what is the relationship between paragraphs 12 and 13 and between paragraphs 15 and 16? Paragraph 12 presents the idea that during war we cannot trust our memory and experience because of the horrors that we see are so bizarre that we feel a permanent discomfort. The following paragraph begins a section of narration that supports this idea through first-person observation. He says, for example, on a chilly rainy day in March 1998, I was in a small Albanian village in Kosovo. By narrating this incident, it supports the ideas in paragraph 12 and continues throughout paragraph 13 through 16. Paragraph 13 provides specific evidence to support the more general assertions he made in paragraph 12. Um, the idea that war, in war, we cannot trust our memory or our experience because the horrors we see are so bizarre. In paragraph 15, it's the last one in this section that's filled with specific images of the particular event of the village in Kosovo. And paragraph 16 widens the circle of experience, describing another incident to uh, reiterate the nature of the horrors of war. The effect of moving from the general to the particular, then from the particular to the general, enhances the reader's awareness that these particulars 
are widespread. Question number three. What is the effect of the highly descriptive details in paragraph 14 and 15? Does it detract from his argument or strengthen it? All right, now we go to paragraph 14 and 15. The highly descriptive details of the mutilated bodies, the vision of the corpses, the lighting, the terribly sad and shaken family members serve to bring life to Hedges' argument. Until this point in the essay, Hedges has been arguing in a manner that was historical, factual, and theoretic, theoretical. But right now, in these paragraphs, he puts real life into words so that the reader can see the devastating truth of what he is arguing about war and how we can barely comprehend the horrific facts of war and may choose to have selective memory about them once the war is over. Without these first-person narratives in the text, the argument might remain sanitized and distant. Instead, Chris Hedges infuses the argument with terribly real and undeniable images. Now we go to question number four. Do you agree with Hedges' claim that the two most important mediums that transmit information to the nation are the media and the schools, and that's found in paragraph 21. Explain your answer. Let's go there. All right, we're at paragraph 21. It's likely, you know, you're going to agree with this claim um, because you're, in your lives, you're pretty familiar with both the media and school. All right, but there, there are other mediums that are just as powerful, such as computers and and of course the social media websites, especially when you realize that it was like Twitter and things on cell phones that helped ignite the recent revolutions in Egypt and in Libya. All right, so here it's a matter of opinion. Now we go to question number five. How do paragraphs 23 through 29 support the assertion that Hedges makes in paragraph 22. All right, let's go there. All right, um, paragraphs 23 through 29 support the assertion made in paragraph 22, which is, of course, the reinterpretation of history and culture is dizzying and dangerous, but is the bedrock of the hatred and intolerance that leads to war. All right, so he goes on to uh, um, illustrate it with specific details. Hodges connects a reinterpretation of history to the underlying hatred by describing the deep roots of history. And the paragraph states how each group, the Muslims, the Serbs, the Croats, view each other's groups, which cause them to spin their history lessons in a direction that fosters hatred towards the other group that is traditionally despised by their people. This is most clear in paragraphs 28 and 29, as Hedges wraps up the description of the way history is bent to feed the goals of the group. Here he describes what the Muslims are taught about the Serbs, what the Serbs say about the Muslims, what the Croatians say about both the Serbs and the Muslims. Thus, Hedges supports his assertion about hatred and how it drives the rewriting and, re and reinterpretation of history. Question six. What does Hedges mean by culture? Provide examples to support what you think he means. What does Hedges think the purpose of culture is? Do you agree? Explain. All right, when Chris Hedges uses the word culture, he is referring to that which allows us to question and examine ourselves and our society. He says that in paragraph three. Now, examples, of course, include art, songs, books, poems, all which reveal what he calls an authentic and humane culture, also found in paragraph three. These forms of self-expression are silenced in favor of the communal myth that nationalistic parties establish in wartime, a group delusion that 
that drives participation into the machinery of war. The true purpose of culture, honest and authentic culture, is to freely voice one's criticisms and observations about one's world and period in history. This type of freedom hinders the production of the myth that the nation must embrace in order to act as one and participate in the war efforts. We go down to question seven. In paragraph 38, Chris Hedges claims that the Vietnam Veteran Memorial is important because it was funded and organized by those who survived rather than by the government. He encourages you, encourage you to visit the website you see up there on the screen for more information about the memorial. Maybe some of you have been there. Do you agree that it offers our nation an opportunity for redemption? Explain. Do you agree with Hedges' claim that the state has prodded us back towards a triumphalism that led us into Vietnam? All right, let, let's go to paragraph 38. All right, um, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was financed solely by civilian funds. And some may argue that the government should have provided the funding in order to make reparations to the dead and injured. Although the government did provide the two-acre plot of land on which to build a memorial, it had no voice in the style or the architecture of the memorial. Some say the memorial does provide an opportunity for redemption due to the hands-off stance of the government, which allowed the voice of the people to speak freely through the design of the memorial. In the years since the memorial was constructed, back in 1982, terrorism on American soil has become an issue and students, uh, and then you might um, you might figure this out that a movement towards this kind of tri triumphalism has led us has led us into Vietnam. Might has led us into the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that your generation has experienced. Some of the very factors we thought we lessons we learned from Vietnam, it seems we haven't learned, and we continue to do. That's a matter of opinion. Number eight. Reread the final paragraph, then reread the quotation from Senator Hiram Johnson with which Hedges begins the chapter. How effectively has Hedges illustrated the meaning of Johnson's assertion? All right, the, um, the meaning of the Johnson quote, which is the first casualty when war comes is truth, is illustrated throughout the essay by various pieces of supporting evidence. From the discussion of the destruction of culture to silence, truthful criticisms of society, to the reinterpretation of history, to the first-hand accounts of hedges of war casualties and how they're reported. Hedges relentlessly provides information to illustrate and support this assertion that truth is not usually present at war. Rather, each country presents its own one-sided view to support its own ends in the war effort. Question 9. What do you think is Hedges' most interesting and provocative statement, and why? This one is a matter of opinion. You have many quotes you've been, you've been highlighting as you read this thing. You know, one of them might be, in wartime, the state seeks to destroy its own culture. That's right at the beginning. Or it could be, you know, once the folly of war is over, folly itself is often all that remains. There are many, just pick out a quote that affected you and be ready to explain it. Finally, the last question. Has reading this essay affected your thinking regarding culture, regarding war? Explain. You're going to have your thoughts about war. You may have relatives who are in the military or, you know, or have families that are strongly against war. Um, you've come from other countries that have a different system of, ex of expression. Um, but this is a personal question that uh, you can explore. All right? All right, so this has been a tutorial of the 10 questions at the end of Chris Hedges' essay, the destruction of culture. I hope this has helped you to understand uh, the essay and the questions and the answers.